Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. It's good to have you all here. I'm Pastor Tim Westermeyer, one of the pastors here at St. Philip the Deacon. And on behalf of St. Philip the Deacon and Mount Olivet Lutheran of Plymouth, which jointly present the Faith and Life Lecture Series, it is my privilege and pleasure to welcome you here tonight to the final event in the 10th anniversary season of the Faith and Life Lectures. So I am thrilled you're here. I'm glad that Spring decided to join us today. Just out of curiosity, how many of you have not been to a Faith and Life event in the past? <laughs> if you could keep your hands up, I'd just like to count you really quick. <laughs> Welcome. We're glad you're here. Uh, just so you have a sense of the flow of the evening, we'll hear from our speaker um, for two or three hours. No, I'm kidding. For 45 or 50 minutes, and then we'll hopefully have a nice long chance to have some good uh, Q and A. Uh, if you have been to these series or these events in the past, you know we have cast a very broad net uh, in terms of bringing our speakers in, and tonight's speaker is no exception. Um, you can read her bio in the program. I always like, though, to ask our speakers for something a little off the beaten trail or unusual. Uh, I usually do that when I pick them up at the airport and take them to their hotel. Today, because she had to do a couple of TV interviews, I didn't have a chance to do that with our speaker, so I talked to her mother instead. <laughs> and the truth is, she didn't really have any great stories either. <laughs> what I will tell you, though, is that when I first approached Glennon more than a year ago, uh, we had a back and forth, and as I do with all of our speakers, I sent her a list of all of the kinds of things we're looking for in speakers, the kind of tone that we're trying to set. And one of the things that I say in that email is we try to respect the intelligence of our audience without the speakers being overly erudite. <laughs> that, that prompted a lot of back and forth about the word erudite. And I insisted that I would fit it into her introduction. So will you wel help me welcome blogger, author, and erudite woman, Glennon Belton. to be here. I'm also terrified <laughs> of a lot of you. Being up here in front of you all is exactly as scary as it looks. <laughs> um, I have been doing a lot of scary things lately because I'm on a book tour. So I've been doing speeches and TV and other things that reclusive writers <laughs> never set out to do. And so I've sort of developed this, um, I don't know, this approach to all of it, which has been this mix of faith and sweat. So I am sweating through a little bit of preparation for each event. And you know you get to that moment where you just know you can't prepare anymore. And then I just show up and try to have faith that God will show up too. And so I'm going to start with a little prayer because I need it. So, um, dear God, you better show up, mister. <laughs> Love, Glennon. <laughs> In and out. <laughs> busy, busy, busy. You got to keep it simple. In and out of there. Okay. So, you know, the further along that I get on my faith journey, I feel like the less I know for sure. And I think that's okay. I actually think that's good. Um, I was talking to a friend recently who I think has one of the most holy jobs that I know of. She works in hospice. And um, she helps people die. And she told me that um, when people are coherent, that the last thing that they always say and the last thing that's always said to them is, I love you. Um, people say it to their families, and their families hold their hands and say it to them before they die. And you know, I think about the first time that I held my little girls and Chase, and I remember saying, welcome, angel. 
and then not knowing what else to say. So I just kept saying, I love you, I love you, I love you. And I just think it's interesting that we start our lives with people telling us that we're loved, and we end our lives with people telling us that we're loved, and then we spend all the days in the middle trying to believe that, <laughs> right? Um, I finally do believe that. I believe that I am completely and wildly loved. Um, not because I'm good or shiny or have anything figured out at all, but just because I'm a child of God, as you are. Um, but it was a really long road for me to get there. I, um, as a child, experienced life as a very scary place. I feel like when you're a kid, they don't teach you much. They just kind of push you out the door. <laughs> Go to school, be a person. And I didn't really know how to be a person. And I thought that other people were kind of scary. And so for a sensitive person like me, at a young age, I discovered bulimia. And you know, people who aren't in the addiction world might not know, but addiction is a very, very decent hiding place. It keeps everybody out completely. It keeps you trapped in a little tunnel. And it's a little bit scary, but for some people, it's less scary than the real world. And um, that's where I hid for a really long time. And I think it's, um, you know, it's easy to, if we don't understand addiction, to, to not relate to that. But what I found is that most people have a hiding place, a place that we go to to be less vulnerable, um, I think for some people it's perfectionism or snarkiness or overworking. But, you know, we all have those places where we go when we get scared just to sort of not be touched. And addiction was mine. Um, I was, I became bulimic very young in elementary school and um, went through high school that way. And then when I got to college, my food addiction morphed into an alcohol addiction. And college things got really, really bad. Um, I didn't have a sober day in college. And I was in such a dark place, literally and figuratively. I lived in a basement, and I partied all night. And the, the darkest moments I remember were when I'd be up the crack of dawn, trying to sleep, and the sun would start rising. And it was absolutely excruciating for me because I just knew that the sun was coming out to shine on everybody else who had a life and who was setting out to make connections and follow their dreams. And I didn't have a life. And I didn't have any dreams. And I just remember thinking the sun was so judgmental. <laughs> Aggressive, really. And I hid from it and hid and hid and hid. And it's funny now, because when I look back, please do not worry about that baby. I just want to tell you now, OK? <laughs> it's not the place to worry about the baby. Baby can cry. Um, so. You know, now when I think back on the sun and how mad I was at it for so long, it's funny because I think of it as sort of like God's love, you know? It's like, it wasn't there to judge me at all. It would have kept coming out over and over again, no matter how long I hid, no matter how long I refused to acknowledge its existence. It would have kept coming up until I was ready to step out into the light. And once I got out there, it wouldn't have been mad at all. It would have just said, oh, there you are. And I would have said, here I am. And that is actually my favorite scripture, here I am. Um, so anyway, I graduated from college, which makes me grateful and extremely suspicious of my alma mater. <laughs> my children will not be going there. We need to raise our standards a little bit, people. Um, so. Then, interestingly enough, I became an elementary school teacher. 
So at this point, I always feel like there's couples going, I told you we should have homeschooled. I told you. <laughs> um, but I do, hi, sister. Hi. This is sister. This is a bad time. <laughs> no, we get, we're, <laughs> we're supposed to just. Oh. Okay, can you hear? Okay. So. Um, <laughs> But she wanted to chat. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I was a teacher. And I was still just, you know, under with alcoholism. But somehow got up every day to go see those kids. And I was a good teacher. I don't know how I did that. But I loved those kids so much. And when I think back now on that time of my life, I'm completely sure that they're the only reason that I lived. Because I was in so much pain, and I was doing so much damage to my body, and I had destroyed all ties I had to good friends or, or my family. And so I think just be, that being needed by those kids is sort of what got me through that time. So Mother's Day, 11 years ago, I found out that I was pregnant. And it was as bad as you could imagine it being, in terms of my alcohol and my drinking. And um, I just remember, I was thinking all day today about that night that I was in the bathroom with my pregnancy test. Um, and I remember just, I was thinking I was sitting on the ground, and I was remembering like the cold tile of the ground in the bathroom. I'm looking up at the ceiling, and the ceiling was all cracked up. And I just remember staring, shaking, and staring at the pregnancy test. And even in that moment, understanding that this was some sort of huge life invitation. And just wondering if I could possibly be brave and bold enough to accept this invitation in the ridiculously banged up state that I was in. And I remember just repeating one word over and over again in my head. It's a word that I couldn't even begin to repeat in this place. I'll tell you that. <laughs> and I remember, sorry, Tim, I, I'm sorry. So I'm just going to avoid eye contact with him until it's over. So um, I remember. And I just thought of this, this today, but I was laying there on the floor holding the stick, saying that word over and over again. And I remember this, this scripture that I had learned a long time before that that said that the Holy Spirit comes when you're trying to pray and intercedes and helps you with your prayer. <clears throat> and I remember distinctly having a vision of the Holy Spirit up, up there with one of those buzzers when you curse, like bleeping me out. <laughs> trying to translate it to God, like, oh, uh, 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 oh, oh. But I now understand that it was a prayer. Me on the floor, totally clueless, completely empty, begging, begging for help. And so I don't know what happened. All I know is that when I stood up, from the bathroom floor, I decided that I was going to try to show up, that I was going to say, here I am. And I remember just thinking, I hope that I'm good enough. I hope I'm good enough. And I quit drinking that day completely. It's been 11 years now, and I haven't had a drink since then. And I didn't know how to be sober. I'd never been a grown-up and been sober. I didn't know how to be a mom. I didn't know how to be a daughter again, or a friend, or a sister, because I'd dropped out. I'd been hiding for so long, but I decided that I was just going to do the next right thing. To the point where I figured, OK, the next right thing is probably to stand up now. I've been in here for a while. <laughs> it was that specific. And now, you know, from where I stand today, and I look back and I think, you know, that's all I ever do. And it's like, if you do the next right thing enough times, it just sort of strings together into a pretty good life. So 
got up the bathroom floor, I decided to show up and say, here I am, which is, you know, what Moses said to God every time God said, Moses, and he'd go, here I am. And I, I just always think that's so cute. Like, I don't know what I can do for you, but here I am. That's my basic attitude. Um, so, did, Moses is cute, right? Here I am. So, so I became, by doing the next right thing, I became a sister to my sister again. And I became a daughter to my parents again. And I actually became a wife. <laughs> Craig was crazy. <laughs> he married me. He said, here I am too. And I became a wife and I became a mother. And I was an okay one. I was a pretty good one. And then I had um, Tish and I had Anna. And I was kind of white knuckling it through that time, you know? And then I had three kids under the age of five in my house. And I thought, oh, this isn't okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I became sort of desperate to talk to people outside of my family about the truth of how I was experiencing life. So I was at the playground one day with a mother, another mother, her name was Tess, and we were having a conversation, but not really having a conversation. We were talking about soccer and all these surface boring things, and I really kind of wanted to have a real conversation with her. And I said, I'm going to go for it. I'm just going to say, here I am, the real me. So I sat down with her on the playground bench, and I said, look, my marriage is in trouble right now, and I think I have some postpartum depression. And I told her about my addiction, and I told her about a lot of my struggles, and she just sort of stared at me for like a really long time. And then she started crying. And she just, it was like unlocking someone. Like she just started talking. And she told me about her family and how they were struggling. And we've become so close. And it was this moment where I thought, I can say here I am, the real me, to another person. And not only will they love me as much, but they might even love me more than the fake me. And so then I decided to start writing from the real me voice about how, yeah, parenthood's great and marriage is great, but they're relationships. And relationships are the best part of life, but the hardest, messiest parts of life. And it seems to me that the only thing that makes that stuff easier is to talk to other honest people about how hard they are and instead of trying to make them perfect, just trying to find the beauty and the laughter in the mess. And so at that time, I was obsessed with monasteries, OK? All different types of monasteries. Because, well, because they have silent monasteries. And I told you I had three kids under the age of five. <laughs> And so I would just, you know, sneak into the bathroom and read about these monks. I could go to these silent cells and no one could get to them. No one asking for snack. No one needs their socks. No one. And so I was just reading a lot of these different books. Um, and I decided I wanted to start my own monastery because I am a raging introvert. And so I have this, like, constant push-pull. Like, I want connection with people, but then I want to hide in my house. And I want friendship, but not really. I don't want to have to go anywhere. Um, like, please be my friend, but don't invite me to coffee. <laughs> so I thought maybe I could start a place where I could have friends, but I could stay in my pajamas. <laughs> And so I loved the idea of how these monks, they drop out of the real world, which I'm always dreaming of doing. I haven't figured out how, but I'm still trying. Drop out of the real world, but then they build their own community. It's not like they completely stay away from people. They just want, they get with other thinkers and prayers and um, you know, people who are trying to live a good life, and they work on peace. They work on how to create a peaceful community. And that's exactly what I wanted for women, for myself. And so at that time, I was becoming totally obsessed with Jesus. I 
okay? I was like, I worship this guy. <laughs> and I was reading and reading and reading the Gospels over and over again, and I just felt like, oh my gosh, I mean, everything he said was just like, pounding me over the head, and it was like so fresh and new, but also like something I'd known my entire life that was just getting yanked out of me. And I just kept thinking, okay, what can I, I wanna, I don't wanna be like Jesus in all of my life, because that's <laughs> really hard. I'm just gonna try this little place on the internet, right? <laughs> I'm just gonna be like Jesus for like 25 minutes a day. <laughs> so, that's what I tried to do. I thought, okay, what is he like really saying? I know there's a lot of controversy, but I think what he's saying is, okay, we're supposed to tell the truth. We're supposed to love other people without criteria or agenda. And we're supposed to not fight back. Okay? So that's, those were my rules for myself on the blog. That's why you've never seen me respond to any comment, no matter how mean it is. And you never will. It's not because I'm there going, oh, love wins. I'm like, <laughs> so I don't type that. It's a very, very big, hard thing to not fight back. And so with those three rules, I started Monastery. And it has been, I think, what's kept me sober. Because every single day, you know, I know there's lots of people that say, they found Jesus, they found God, and, you know, everything's perfect, okay? Now, I'm not mad at those people anymore, but let's just say they don't get invited to my house. <laughs> How you doing, Tim? Okay, <laughs> okay. so, I, love God. I think God loves me. I love Jesus. I think Jesus, Jesus knows I'm working on it. Yeah. I have a great family. I have friends. I have a career I love. And I'm sad a lot. Really sad a lot. And lonely a lot. And I get angry and impatient. And, you know, it makes me think, okay, if we have a God who loves us so much and could erase all of that stuff if God wanted to, why are we left with it? Why are we left with those uncomfortable feelings? And so what I have come to believe is that those feelings are well used as guides. You know, if I didn't get so lonely, I would never be so desperate to write. I would never have the feeling that I have to get to my computer and tell my story and hear other women say, me too, me too, me too. I do that because I really need comfort. And because I do that, lots of other women get comfort too. So that feeling of loneliness, it's a guide to lead me to do something. And you know, the pain that we have, I mean, my, my marriage is, in, is having some serious trouble right now. And um, that's okay. There's still lots and lots of beauty in the mess. But I can't tell you how many stories from women I've been able to answer or read that I wouldn't that have made such a connection that never I wouldn't have got them at all. I wouldn't have gotten them six months ago. And now they come exactly at the right time all the time. And you know, if we didn't have suffering, we wouldn't work so hard to alleviate the suffering of others. I mean, at our at Monastery, we do so much. It's it's not charity work; it's justice work, really. But um, it's amazing because every time somebody posts a need and says, "You know, I'm a single mom and I don't have diapers." Three minutes later, there's always, there's always somebody else that says, I was a single mom 10 years ago. I didn't have money for diapers, and I'm sending you three boxes. 
You know, it's like the pain is what brings us together. And I haven't had more magical moments, more affirming and comforting moments than, I'm, than I've had where suffering people helped other suffering people. I will take it. I'll take all of it just to have those moments. I wouldn't trade the suffering. If I had to, I would not give up any of it just to see those moments. So, you know, those uncomfortable feelings, the only thing that I have learned that helps. So there's two scriptures that I keep in my mind all the time. And one is, here I am. And the other is, be still. And I used to th be still and know that I'm God. And I used to think they were sort of contradictory. Like, here I am, be still. Here I am, be still. Should I, should I here I am, should I be still? Um, but now, I think of them as sort of more like a rhythm of life. Like in order for me to be brave enough to say here I am all the time, I have to be still and remember who I am. That I'm a child of God and I'm gonna mess up and make huge mistakes. And that's okay. That's okay, I can still show up. And it makes me think of, you know, sort of, I'm always thinking of the posture of Christianity. Like, what does it look, literally look like to walk, engage in Christianity? And being an introvert, I really just always want to do this, you know? I just want to be closed up and not let anybody hurt me and cover all of my vital organs <laughs> and take no hits. Or... I want to be like this <laughs> and throw the hits before they get to me, right? But what I've learned at Monastery is that we have to live like this. We just have to be wide open. Wide open. If we are not wide open and ready to be crucified at any second, there's probably not as much magic going on as there could be. And what happens when you go out into the world and you say, here I am in all of my mess and imperfection, is some people are comforted and some people hate you. <laughs> and I will tell you a story. Um, a few months ago, I was having a bit of a breakdown and I went to my bed and crawled under the covers and did my this thing, because we have to do that sometimes. And like an idiot, I Googled myself. OK. So here's what you don't want to do when you're having a bad day, is Google yourself. So this thing called a forum, a forum popped up. And I was reading it. And I was saying, I can't believe these people are being so mean to this woman. And then I kept reading, and I saw Craig and Tish and Emma, and I thought, these people are talking about me. And I called my sister, crying. And I said, you are not going to believe what people are saying about me. They are saying that I am over the top dramatic. They're saying, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> We're getting there. They're saying that I only got married because I was pregnant. They're saying that my family's falling apart. They're saying that I'm an alcoholic, and I was a druggie, and I'm a bulimic, and I was crying, and my sister said, OK, but all of those things are true. <laughs> And so I hung up on her. <laughs> and I just sat, tried to get still. I tried to get still. And I remembered, oh yeah, that's my point. My point is not that I'm perfect or that I have anything figured out at all. My point is just that I can be really messy and confused and sad sometimes and lost sometimes, and I can still show up. 
and I can still make connections with people, and I can actually even make a difference for people just by showing up. So that's the only thing that I've promised myself, is that I am going to show up, I'm going to be kind, and I'm going to be brave. And that's the only thing we've told our children that they ever have to do or be. And I think once you figure out how to be a truth teller, the second most important thing is to learn how to listen to a truth teller without making her feel like you're scared or angry or uncomfortable. You know, I wanted to learn how to, I knew how it felt to kind of come and say, here I am, and take hits. And while it's OK, it could be better. So I think that when I think about that, I mean, I've had, I spend half of my day every day writing. And I spend the second half of the day when the kids are at school reading. I read every single letter and email that I get from everywhere around the world. So I feel like I am just like a treasure chest of stories. And I know for a fact that it's the most important part of my job. You know, even when I had read so many stories about women who had struggled with their husbands, that when I started struggling with my husband, I was doing my dramatic freak out thing, but there was like a voice in the back of my head that was going, oh, this is that part. Oh, and this is that part. Because I'd read so many stories of women who'd gone before me in extremely similar situations. And I think about when I, when I try to be a good listener, when I try to take someone in, when I try to treat people like they really are, which is God. I mean, every single one of us is God, which means every single one of us is an invitation to know more about God. And you know, it reminds me of Moses again. Moses! And how he, he asked, he begged God. He said, God, let me see you. And God said, I can't let you see me. You, I'm too bright. You would die. And he said, but I will show you where I've just been. And every time I read or hear a story from another woman, I feel like I've seen where God has just been. And we have to listen to each other's stories because it's so much easier to see where God's just been in someone else's life than it is in your own life. You know, I can read 400 stories from other people and say, uh-huh, she's fine. She's got it. I can see that. It's, fine. it's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. And I lose my keys, and it's the end <laughs> of the world. So. Treating other people's stories like invitations to know more about God, it's not just for them, it's for us. It comforts us. And whenever I think about being a listener, which to me I think is the most important thing we can be, I still think of my two favorite scriptures, which are, here I am, and be still. It's really all we have to do to be a listener, just here I am, and then just be still and let another person soak in. Um, I also think about you know, the story of Mary and Martha. I like, I like any story that helps me get out of cooking. <laughs> and so one of my favorite Bible stories is when Jesus comes and visits these two sisters, Mary and Martha. And Martha's like the responsible one. And so she is, you know, cooking and I you don't know, I'm sure she has like trays and I don't know, I don't have those things, but like <laughs> pots. And um, she's like whipping up a cooking domestic storm. And she is so frustrated because it's like Jesus and all the disciples in her living room. And can you imagine? Like, I can't even handle it when my kids friend comes over and asks for potato chips. But here's like Jesus. And she's like, oh my god, God is here. Like, is he gluten free? So, so um, Martha goes to Jesus and says, dude, Mary is sitting 
in the living room. I am working so hard. I've got all these pots. I got 12 disciples. She's sitting there at the bottom of Jesus' feet, just listening. And Jesus says, this is my favorite part. <laughs> he says, Mary has chosen the better part, and it will not be taken from her. <laughs> Get out of the kitchen, lady. <laughs> On the floor. Okay, I don't really know if that's an excuse to get out of cooking, but I do know that I think the better part of listening is sitting at somebody's feet and soaking them in and not worrying about putting on any kind of show to impress them at all. And it's my absolute honor and favorite part of my job is listening to women's stories. And it's changed my life. It's changed the way I walk around on this earth because everybody I see now, I just see as just a whole novel full of stories of triumphs and loss and great, great successes and pain. And um, I'm just honored to walk this earth with all of these warriors. Um, so anyway, I guess what I want to end this with, and then we'll go in some, into some questions, is that one of my favorite, another one of my favorite scriptures is when Jesus says, you will have trouble in this world. You will have trouble. You know, he didn't say, like, most likely. <laughs> or, like, if you let your kid watch five hours of TV instead of two. It's like... Just let them watch, because everybody's having trouble. <laughs> Give yourself a break. <laughs> it's a coming, OK? It's a coming. But he says, take heart, which I love that. I don't know why. I just think it's precious. Take heart, because I'm overcoming the world. And what that means to me is just love wins. And despite every shred of evidence to the contrary, all is well. Because you are loved. More completely and fully and wildly than you could possibly imagine. And so is everybody else. And that's it. Ta-da! <laughs>
although again, it wouldn't be until the year following next year since we've already scheduled next year's. Uh, this is, I mentioned this is the last event of this year, and so I want to pause and make a special thank you to uh, a handful of people and organizations. Um, this event has always been from the very beginning, free and open to the public, and I feel passionately that we should do that as a gift back to the community that wouldn't be possible without some very, very generous people. So these, again, are in your program. I'm not gonna lit name all of the names, but I'm grateful to all of them. Uh, Thrivent Financial for Lutherans, the Crossroads Group has been with us uh, for a number of years now. Jim and John, I, di I didn't see you before. I don't know if you're here, are you? But in any case, thank you to both of you. Uh, Greg at Productivity, wherever you are. Uh, Jim at Cressa, thank you. Uh, Tom at TCF Bank, I don't think Tom is here. Uh, Phil at Rapid Packaging, Bruce at Sparky Abrasives, he has been with us from the very beginning. Um, we have a number of uh, educational partners, including Luther Seminary, Augsburg, Center for Faith and Learning, and the McLaurin uh, CSF Institute at the University of, of Minnesota, and some in-kind sponsors like Fuzzy Duck and The Bookcase. And I, did I mention, by the way, her book is available for purchase in the Narthex following? from the bookcase, so thank you. Um, anyway, you could not be here tonight at no cost without the amazing generosity of those individuals and organizations I just mentioned, as well as all of the individuals listed in your program. Would you please give them a big round of applause? Just a couple of other quick thank yous, well, three maybe. I want to thank the people who serve as ushers. Thank you so much for your hospitality out there. Thank you. <laughs> um, I also want to say a special thank you to my friend Jeff Elstead, who introduced uh, the evening with his wonderful music. Jeff has been with us from the start. Jeff, thank you so much for making us so welcome. Is Jeff, is your website still jeffelstead.com? Okay. Glennon, yes. get your people, you know. Okay. No, I'm just telling you to tell people about Jeff because he's Delicious. awesome. Yes. Oh, yes, okay, yes, okay. I'm going to sit down now. <laughs> I'll write that down for you later. Okay. okay. And then the final thing, uh, people ask me a lot, where, where do you get the ideas for these events? Some of them come from here. Most of them, frankly, it's difficult to tie a chain all the way back to how the idea came. But tonight's event, actually, there's a very specific person who gave me the idea over at Caribou more than a year ago, and she's here, and I only feel like it's fair and honorable to thank her. So Amanda Berger, Amanda. would you please stand? <laughs> so you can all mob her later and say, thanks for making this possible. Okay, Glennon, now you can't Okay, come it's back time. Up. Are you sure? Okay. It's time, yes. I think so, yes. So, we're going to take some questions if you'd like. So, come to the mics. We'll go for, um, well, maybe 20, 25 minutes. We'll see how we, we do. Okay? Unless no one has any questions, in case we'll all go home. Hi, a boy. Hi. Hi. Yeah, I know. <laughs> a boy monkey. Yeah. So you talked a little bit about the isolation that you experienced in your relationships during your festive past. Yes. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how you were able to really cement and, and hide all of the behavior and all of the, the patterns that you were living out, especially from sister and your parents. And then now that you've achieved sobriety, how you've gone through the process of mending and rebuilding those relationships. Mm. Okay, so great questions. First of all, I was, it wasn't a secret from anyone. I am officially the worst secret keeper ever <laughs> in a lot of ways. But I was, my family knew I was bulimic. Um, they tried everything. I went, I was hospitalized in high school. Um, I went to therapy. As we know, none of those things work unless you're ready for them and you want them, and I wasn't. Um, everyone in my life knew that I was an alcoholic. I think sometimes, you know, when you're sort of in the midst of that tornado of addiction, it's, it really is like a tornado, and nobody can get close, because it's just collateral damage everywhere. 
Um, so, you know, my parents tried really hard, but I just, it doesn't matter how hard a family tries. And that's what I tell so many people who write to me. I mean, there is not enough love in the world to fix an addict. It has to come from inside, and I still don't know what that magic moment is inside of an addict and how they cross over. But I know it doesn't have anything to do with how well the people around her are loving her. Um, and, you know, how I've mend, I, I, I think, you know, I've rebuilt those relationships just by doing the next right thing, one thing at a time. Um, I never, sometimes I do feel like my whole life is a 12-step program because every day, you know, I wake up in the morning and say, Clearly, I have no control over what's going <laughs> to happen, and clearly, my life is unmanageable. And um, you know, I sort of go through all the steps real quick in the morning. Um, but I don't know. I mean, to tell you the truth, I've never said this in, through, in front of a group of people before. Um, it's okay, sister. Um, I I don't know. I simply became an addict so early. I was eight, like eight, I think, nine, maybe. I don't. You know, there's a lot of apologies that are supposed to go on. And I think I have a bit of a chip on my shoulder about that. Like, I feel like when I was eight years old, I did the best I could. And I was a kid, you know? So I don't really feel like going all the way back there and apologizing to everybody. I mostly apologize to myself. I feel like I did a really good job um, getting out of it. And I'm proud of myself, and I'm proud of my family for hanging in there. And um, I just stay as far as I can from shame. Mm -hmm. I think being ashamed of yourself is what it sends over and over again is what sends addicts back. And so that's why over and over again I tell myself, I am good enough. I'm like that girl in the mirror, like Jack Hanley, like, I'm good enough, doggone it, I, people like me. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, we, I think people get confused about insecurity versus shame. You know, insecurities are just those little things that bother us about ourselves and other people. You know, my kid doesn't have enough, not that's little, I mean, I have that going on too, but my kid doesn't have the right friends, or my marriage is, you know, rocky, or, you know, all the things we all deal with that we're going to have to bat away from our, ourselves the rest of our lives. But shame is that big whale that just swallows you and says, you are not good enough. So I just try to stay away from the shame by pouring myself out every day and remind, getting it out in the light. Because once that dark and scary stuff is out inside you is out in the light, it's not so scary anymore. Mm. You learn that you're not bad, you're just human. Yeah. And I have to keep doing that every day. Thank is that you. okay, boy monkey? <laughs> Glenn, and this is related as a person of faith and an introvert as well. Um, Two of the ways that I understand that people deal with the critiques that you get on the internet and call your sister and then hang up on her. One way is to develop a very thick skin, which you don't have. And another way is to give it all to God, which I don't think you do, unless I'm wrong. So what is your third way? Or do you give it all to God? Okay, so I will tell you that it still hurts me like crazy. I don't know if it's ever going to not hurt me. Because part of my job is to stay sensitive. You know, I'm a writer. Like, I can't just all of a sudden get really tough and not be sad or happy about things. I have to, people always say, what you have to do is develop a soft heart and a tough skin. And I'm like, okay, well, write a manual. That's <laughs> helpful, thanks, that's really helpful. Um, I think that one of the ways, this is so ridiculous, but I'm gonna tell you, because you seem like a sweet, honest, nice person, so I'm gonna tell you the truth. So I really love to be of service to women. That's like the thing that helps me. Like if I'm having an awful day, if I can get on Facebook and like respond to a couple people's things, I feel like at least I did something good today. And so, you know these people that like do a lot of the critiquing or these forums and stuff, they, they do it, like that's their job. It's not, well they don't get paid for it, but that's what they think is their job, okay? So, <laughs> so when I'm up, there, Oh, my sister has her head in her hand. That's not a good sign. <laughs> I'm going to get it later. Okay, so when they're on me that day, I always think, okay, this is my day. They're trashing me today. I have a great support system, a family that will listen to me, cry through it with me. I have a good friends who, are, who will help me through this. And if they're on me today, that means they're taking it easy on somebody else today. Because that's how it works. 
Like there's like a sh there's like 20 of us, and then there's just like every day it's somebody else. <laughs> so I always think if I haven't done anything else good today, I took the heat off somebody, and then I just sit down and eat Twizzlers. <laughs> Hi, thank you. I thoroughly enjoyed this. I came um, for the humor and the healing part, and so obviously I'm not disappointed on any level. I think that Boy Monkey sort of indirectly asked my question, so, <laughs> so Girl Monkey will ask it in a little more direct way. I find it really interesting, and I related to that we always find ourselves on the floor asking for help, and that was my moment of going, I can't take it for five more minutes. We have a lot in common of being recovered in our addictions. And I found uh, a God of my understanding through a 12-step program. And I just wanted to ask you if, that was, if that's part of your healing, because it's been a profound part of mine. Yeah. Well, congratulations, by the way. Yay! Thank you. Girl monkey! <laughs> Um, I always, I mean, you know, addicts are my people, like my people. You know, we can kind of spot each other, you know. Um, and I still go to 12-step meetings sometimes just because I really like the people in the 12-step meetings. Um, I went in the beginning. I mean, my sister took me to my first AA meeting, and they give you a brochure at the beginning, and they give you a list of things that you might be an alcoholic if, like, you've had four drinks in a row, if you've blacked out, if you... And my sister and I read it like, oh, God. <laughs> and my sister goes, AA might not be enough. We might need AAA. <laughs> Very good. So, um, I read about love, respect, and believe in 12-step programs. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Yes. Hi. My name is Margaret from Minneapolis, Margaret. Hi, Minneapolis, Margaret. Hi. Um, so we, or you talk all the time about how it's hard. Life is just hard. Not because you're doing it wrong, but just because it is. And then we also talk about living in the light. Um, and if living is hard, living in the light is even harder. Yeah. And so you talked about uh, shrieking out that shame uh, that Boy Monkey brought up. Um, and relying on the people around you, and you have a sister. And, um, but when people have news, and they have mental illness, and they have recovery, uh, and they don't have those support systems, and not all of us are going to write a blog, mm -hmm. um, what is it that the rest of us can do to start living in the light? Oh. <laughs> are there any volunteers? <laughs> OK, so this is what I think. I, will, I had one thing that, I mean, the blog is where I go deep and where I get it out. But, I mean, I wouldn't even recommend that to anyone. It's crazy. Like, it's not that good of an idea, to tell you the truth. It's wild. I think that you have to have somebody safe, though. I mean, you have to find somebody safe that you can go deep with. Because I think one of our problems is we stay on the surface of things. We talk about the details of our lives because we think that's a safe place to be. But it's not, because the details of our lives are so different. You know, we all have different marital situations, and we all have come from different backgrounds and different families, and we all have different finances and jobs. And so when we stay there, we end up feeling alone. But if we can find somebody to go deep with, to get to the most personal places, that's actually the most universal place. Because we all have different details, but the deeper you get our pain and our loneliness and our joy, those are all the same. That's why it doesn't even matter what I'm writing about on the blog, and people respond to it, because it's the feeling behind it. So I just know that you have to have somebody. And if you don't have somebody, you have to find somebody that you can trust with your insides and will still love you afterwards. Because I think it took me being able to get my insides out to another human being and have them still have them accept me for me to really even understand that God could feel the same way about me. I mean, I think we're supposed to be able to do that backwards, but I couldn't. It took me people saying, I see all of you, and I still love you, to understand that love, that I already have that from God, and I actually don't have to be loved perfectly, because I already am. Um, did I talk my way around that one sufficiently enough? I, well, can I ask a second question? Of course. Okay. 
So I think a lot of us have that. We have a bestie. We have somebody, mm -hmm. a therapist, somebody. Yeah. Uh, but it's really hard. I don't know. Maybe the rest of you don't feel this way. It's really hard to take it that next step. And it's the mom, you know, to do it with the mom at the park or um, somebody at work or, you know, to shed that kind of armor of like, I'm together. Mm -hmm. I have my crap together. Because people aren't nice, necessarily. Okay, they look at you true. like you're crazy. I'm not going to lie. Um, <laughs> Here's the thing, sister, we're trying to start a revolution here, all right? Soon there's gonna be people walking around without their armor all over the place. Just give me a little more time. All right? But I do know from experience that the more people who do it, who just say, here I am, and who aren't all about it, who say, here I am, and I know I'm not perfect, and that's okay. I'm good enough. I'm not going to say, the here I am, and I suck, and my butt's big, and I blah, blah, blah. <laughs> like, here, sorry, here I am, <laughs> here I am, and I know I'm not perfect, and that's really okay with me. You know, I think it, it's humility and the, it's like humility and confidence, humility and confidence. Be still, here I am. It's a balance. Good luck with all that. <laughs> This is really nerve-wracking, just uh -huh. standing here. Yeah. Wow, okay. Um, so I'm gonna ask a mommy question, okay. because this is actually how I got introduced to Momastery, was, so there probably are some people in here that are like this, and you're awesome, okay? But the super moms mm -hmm. that are, you know, like, like they make their own baby food, and they do all the like, right stuff, and they so post about, about it on me. Facebook, okay. yeah, yeah, and like Go the ahead. laundry's perfect, yeah, all that. So one of those friends, um, she posted something that was monastery. And I was like, what is this? this? This is probably not relatable for me because I'm not, you know, there. Um, but my question is around that, okay. right? So as a mom and a working mom who chooses to work, right? And um, there's just this constant pull. Mm -hmm. um, and especially because I think people on the outside looking in, they don't, they don't understand it, like, you don't have to work is something that I hear, right? Which is interesting. So I, you know, I have a four-year-old daughter, and a lot of what I, I hear and read, right, is I have to love myself so much and be so comfortable in who I am so that I can give that as a gift to her. Um, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not there. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, what do you do in the meantime? Mm -hmm. You know? Okay. Jeez, Tim, where did you get these people? You're asking really hard questions. Okay. Um, okay. First of all, we have to quit the whole super mom versus slacker mom thing because we're all both. And you know what? We slacker moms, I know what you're talking about. Obviously, I am, I'm in one camp. <laughs> okay. But we need the super moms. I am telling you, I have a really good friend named Kelly Hampton. Does anyone read her blog? Okay. She is a super mom. And I don't even put out Christmas decorations. I don't do anything. I just say, let's go to Kelly's. <laughs> she does everything. She pities my children. She has stockings for them. She has... <laughs> we have to use each other. And, and I, we're still trying to figure out what I'm going to do for her. It's been a couple years, so I'm not sure what the back and forth is yet. But she's going to think of something, I'm sure. So, I really do think we need each other, you know? I mean, every time I go to one of my kids' uh, parties in school, and there's all those things that those moms do, and I'm like, thank you, because I am not going to do that. How do you not feel bad? You just well, don't feel bad? You're like, this is just not me, it's not, it's not what no, I No, I don't feel bad at all. I feel thrilled. What if you had to do that stuff? <laughs> My friend, Michelle, I had this conversation with one of my friends, and, and she was, you know, having a potluck, which is, no, I'm obviously not coming if it's a potluck. <laughs> and I explained to her that that's terrifying. I mean, you, don't, you can't just say to someone, bring a dish. Like, to me, bring a dish means bring a dish. <laughs> that's not what they mean. They mean bring a dish and something to put on top of the dish that people can eat. And so I told her, it stresses me out. Like, I feel like every time I go somewhere, I have to bring a dish. And I don't know how to make a dish. 
And she said, okay, look, I don't invite you to our parties because you, obviously because you can cook, because you can't cook. But I do invite you because you are a really good listener. And so now every time someone sends out one of those emails and says, what are you going to bring? I say, I'm going to bring my listening ears. <laughs> <laughs> we have to know our gifts and be comfortable in them. And stop thinking about all the stuff we're not good at and start thinking about the stuff we are good at. Because no, I can't bring egg rolls. But I can listen and make you feel like you're being heard. You know, there's things I can do. What were your other questions? <laughs> In the, oh, loving yourself. Loving well, yourself. Yeah, and how, do you, how are you a role model for your children? Right, I hate that word. So, I mean, how do you kind of lead by example right. for your children if you're not where you want to be yet? Yeah, I don't think any of us are where we want to be yet. I mean, none, if we're alive, we shouldn't be, you know? I mean. Some of us, some of us think we are. Okay, yeah. well, we don't invite those not people me. over. No, not me. We already discussed that. But I think that, here's the deal. All I know is that I'm a human being, and I'm constantly making mistakes, and I'm okay with that, and I'm constantly forgiving myself and starting over. And so all I know about my kids is that they are, God willing, on their way to being jacked up human beings, because that's what we all are, right? And so I don't know where they need to be. I just know that they need to know that we all fall down, and we get ourselves back up, and we try again. But that's what we do until we're dead. And I tell them all the time that I don't care whether they're good at soccer. We don't even want them to be good at soccer. We pray for mediocrity, because do you know what happens when your kids are good at stuff? Have you seen? Why does everyone want their kids to be good at stuff? You have to go to like 20,000 more practices. <laughs> I don't understand. Craig's always like, should I go kick the ball with Chase? And I'm like, no, man. Are you crazy? Don't practice. <laughs> so the dream is average to slightly below. Yeah. And you show up, you be kind, and you be brave. That's all I can handle, ever. That's all I ask for my kids. That's it. The end. Okay. Yes. Hi. Hi. The second time I'm talking to you today, because you talked to me on Facebook. Oh, hi. I know, it's a really big deal. Um, so it's more of a thank you, and I'm sorry to come in here and be a real rule breaker, um, but you have given me so much perspective on life. And so to try and come up here and think of a question, I am an off-the-scales extrovert, like ENFP. I'm I so happy help. and I love people. But the people in my life that I love dearly are not. And so how do I become a friend and not ask you for coffee? OK. Oh, god. Don't ask us for coffee. Leave a bag of Starbucks, knock, how. and run. OK. <laughs> OK, so what you need to do if you want to understand introverted people in your life is read the book Quiet by Susan Cain. Okay. Game changer. Okay. So good. Okay. And helps parents who are extroverts deal with introverted kids and helped my husband and I. He's an extrovert. I'm an introvert. People who are extroverts can feel so rejected by introverts mm -hmm. because we don't want to get together. Mm -hmm. I just, some, my friend sent me an e-card today that said, I'm sorry I've been such a bad friend because I've been too busy being an awesome hermit. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why it, it is that way. Mm -hmm. All I know is that um, that book helped me and helped Craig and I'm sure will help you. It's really good. Great. Thank you very much. My publicists get so excited when I spend lots of time talking about other people's books. <laughs> yes, go ahead. You love your shirt. Yes. It says we can do hard things. <laughs> Hi, Glennon. Hi. I love you. I'm so excited you're here. Thank oh. you for being brave and telling us all of your stories. Um, I'm here with my sister. Sister. And she's here from Chicago. I was curious. I think you live in Florida. I was curious if your sister does too. Was one of my questions. If no, you guys my live sister, close. She still lives in Northern Virginia. Okay. I had to move to Florida because I have neurological Lyme disease, and the um, weather was brutal on me in Virginia because it was really hard on my joints and adrenals. So 
I moved to Naples and there's lots of sun and it's better there. But we still see each other like every two weeks. <laughs> yeah. Um, but my real question was, I loved your book, I devoured it, and you. Um, you have so many great stories that I'm familiar with from your blog, and I wondered if it was really hard to narrow them all down for your book. Um, I was looking for like Chase and the Onion Man, oh, I know. or you know, different ones, and I was like, I wonder yeah. if she's going to sell, you know, tell that one. Yeah. So um, I love the ones you included, but I just wondered about that process. Was it like, did you want to narrow it down so it was a quick read? I mean, I couldn't make it as long as I would have liked to because they have rules, but, um, but I don't know. I mean, I remember one day I just had every single essay I'd ever written all out on my floor in my bedroom and I was trying to like pick and choose and it was really hard. It was like leaving out your babies, you know? Well, it was way harder than that because I love leaving my babies. <laughs> on the way, before we got here, Tish said, mommy, and this will help with your mommy go thing. She said, mommy. I don't want you to go to work. I want you to stay home. And I thought about feeling guilty, but then she, I didn't say what I thought, which was, oh, honey, staying home with you is my work. <laughs> and I go on vacation when I'm <laughs> so You're just confused, sweetheart. <laughs> anyway. Um, so yes, it was hard, and there were things that I just really wanted to talk about that I even found too personal to talk about on the blog, like my sister's marriage and the stuff with my marriage that I knew that felt more like they belonged in a book than on the blog. So I knew what I wanted to add, and we just had to rearrange from there. Thank you for being Thank here. Thank you. All right, Glennon. Yes. You've both been standing there, so let's have the two of you ask, and that'll be the last two, okay? Does that work? Yeah, yeah. Great, 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 great. Hi, Glennon. Hi. I'm Rhody. I loved you, too. Um, I, love you. I just wanted to ask, I think that we're, one of the places you're going next is Indiana for Project Home Indy, and I just wanted to know, I know that not everyone that follows the blog may not know what that is, but what are you looking forward to the most? That. At, you mean at that event? Yeah. Well, let me tell you guys what happened on Monastery. So every once in a while, we have a thing called a love flash mob on Monastery. It's called a love flash mob because a couple years ago, remember everybody was doing those flash mobs where like one person would start dancing and then everyone else would start dancing. And I was a little late to the craze. <laughs> I'm still obsessed with them. Oprah's link has like five million views and I'm like three million of them. Because um, it just sounds like such a good metaphor, you know? Like everybody wants to dance, but one person has to like risk looking stupid and start dancing, and then everybody else knows the rhythm already. And all right, my family's heard this so many times. So, um, what were we talking about? Project Home Indie. Yeah. Indie. So, all right. So I revealed the cover of the book, just the cover, like a couple months ago, and. The monkeys went so crazy with pre-orders that we went from like number 999 million on Amazon to number four in like five hours. And so everyone from New York was calling going, D you hacked the Amazon. <laughs> it was wild. And I was feeling so grateful. And I had just read this book about by Bob Goff, Love Does, so sweet. And so I was thinking about gratitude and how grateful I was and how gratitude needs to be a verb. And when you feel really grateful, you have to like turn it into something. So I was like, I'm going to check my email and see what's there because people send me requests sometimes. So there was this precious email from this woman named Sarah who runs an amazing nonprofit in Indiana for teen moms. And they do comprehensive care for the moms and the babies for two years. And she said, we don't have any money. We're struggling. We can't pay to bring you. But will you come speak for us? So I was like, sure, gratitude does. So I emailed her and said, I'm coming. Just tell me where to be, blah, blah, blah. So we got on the phone the next day. And she started telling me about her nonprofit. And she said that the night before, there had been a 14-year-old girl that came into the home with her four-month-old baby. And she didn't have a home. And she'd had a really rough life. And she needed a break. And um, they didn't have the money to bring her in because everything's done by ratios with state funding. And because they are such an amazing nonprofit, I, well, I said, well, okay, what if I just gave you the money? Like, how much do you need? And she said, $83,000. And I said, okay, how about we forget I said about the thing when I was going to give you the money? <laughs> <laughs> but then I started thinking about the monkeys, and I thought, maybe I can't do it 
you know, our philosophy at Monkey See, Monkey Do, which is our nonprofit, is um, we can't do any great things, but we can do small things with great love. I didn't make it up, Mother Teresa, I'm not trying to plagiarize. <laughs> um, so I thought, okay, maybe we can do this. We can have a love flash mob. So, I, so the next day, I posted the story about the girl, the 14-year-old girl, told the monkeys we needed $83,000, and our limit is $25, because we have people from all different walks of life, and I want a single mom for whom $5 is a big deal to feel as empowered and as a part of the giving as somebody for whom $25 is no big deal. So we have a limit, and in five hours, five and a half hours, we had raised $83,000 for this girl. So, on a love flash mob day, I get on and I talk about how this is love wins and this is going to work no matter what and we are so awesome and this is going to happen and then I sit in my bed and sweat and I swear it's never going to work. We're all falling flat on our face. This is awful. This is all crashing in today and I just sit in my bed and sweat and sweat and sweat. Emma walked in the last day and it was like two hours into the love flash mob and I was staring at the computer just praying, praying, praying that people would donate for this girl. And she walked in and she said, Mommy, what are you doing? And I just looked at her and she goes, she turned and walked out and she goes, I think it's love flash mob day. <laughs> so anyway, I was talking about the love flash mob at, in Cincinnati, Ohio at the book signing last week. And somebody asked about it, and I was talking about Sarah, this woman who runs it, and how passionate it is, she is, and how courageous it was, and the energy that it took just to write that email. You know, like, I wouldn't have written that. Like, I would have just thought, this lady's not going to respond. What are the chances? But she loves those girls so much that he sp she spent an extra hour. That just means so much to me. Like, she spent that hour on a wing and a prayer that something would fall through. I mean, would, would, would happen. So I was talking about Sarah, and somebody raises her hand, and she goes, I'm Sarah. So it was this moment, and so amazing, and she came up and she told everybody, um, the girl, the 14-year-old girl, moved in that night of the Love Flash Mob. They called her and said, we have the money now, you can come in. A bunch of moms in America raised the money for you. This is a girl who, who didn't have a mom in her life, and who's literally never gotten a break. And she got a phone call that was probably an answer to prayer that said, a bunch of women who have never met you before believe in you and want the best for you and your baby. And she is kicking, she is doing awesome. <laughs> she wants to be a doctor, she's a leader, she's back in school, babies in care, I get to go see them in two weeks and hug them. Thanks, best $25 I ever spent, oh, by the way. Um, it's not really a question so much, but last summer, um, my husband moved out for the second time that year, and I'm out there, got home from work, and I'm mowing the lawn, and my neighbor, who's with me now, um, walks down the street, and I never met her, and she's like, I'm Ariana, and I just started crying. She's like, are you okay? And I'm like, just crying, because I'm like, my husband moved out, and I'm going to cry. And, um, you know, I've got four kids, and like, it's just, everything's crashing down. And then shortly after, I found your blog, and I just thought, all these years, people have been telling me, don't tell those stories. You know, people don't want to hear those ugly things. I had my first kid when I was 19, and my grandpa was like, she's going to be fine. You know, you'll be fine. And I, and I am. And um, I haven't always been fine. I mean, I, I got married, and I kept all those things under. And as soon as I, like, told her, you know, this ugly stuff, and she was like this... I just feel like she was, she moved in on our black for a reason. Mm -hmm. And um, she's been like an angel to me. And he moved back in, he left, he moved back in, and he finally left after Christmas. Um, and I said, don't come back. And at that moment, like all these people just kind of came out of the woodwork and supported me. And I didn't feel as alone as I did when I was with him, which is the worst feeling ever yeah. is when you're sitting right next to someone who's supposed mm -hmm. to love you. and be supportive and you, you feel more alone than if you were just sitting there alone. Mm -hmm. And I just, 
you have not so pretty stories and I have a blog which, you know, my husband's like, why are you doing that? And he still, you know, shames me for writing mm -hmm. and because I don't have pretty stuff to say necessarily about everything, but I try to be, you know, edit and not fight and um, it's just, you've been an inspiration to me. So oh, thank you. Sister Fair, <laughs> give me a hug. <laughs> Any final words? Thank you. <laughs> Love you. Uh, two quick things. She mentioned Bob Goff. He's going to be here next November for Faith and Life. So come to that as well. Uh, thank you all for being here. I have a little gift for Glennon. It's a black piece of granite. We thought about putting the word erudite on it. But we Google didn't. It. Instead, we just say that with thanks to Glennon Melton for bringing faith to life. And we do thank you oh. so very much. Thank you so much.